welcome everyone. Today's, the next panel is going to talk about Iran. We know there's been a lot of saber rattling from Iran and we know we have to take that seriously. Iran has also been very clear about increasing their production of highly enriched uranium. This represents a threat not only to the, to the region, but to Israel and to the entire world. You add to that the recent explosion in Natanz and you realize the critical urgency of this issue. The new administration has signaled very clearly that they wanna enter into a new agreement. And so the most pressing question now is what will that new agreement look like? I think everyone would agree the old agreement is not going to be sufficient to get broad bipartisan support. And so the real question in my mind is, will the new agreement address ballistic missiles? Will it address Iran's regional aggression in places like Yemen, Syria, the Emirates, Bahrain, Turkey, Afghanistan? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, will it address the issue that Iran remains the largest state sponsor of terrorism? Those were issues that were not addressed in the last agreement that will need to be addressed in the new agreement. There's no better panel to be able to address these issues and there's no better moderator who knows more about this subject than Brian Hook. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to the McCain Institute. Hi, I'm Brian Hook, uh, former U.S. Special Envoy for Iran, and I'm very pleased to be uh, uh, invited by the McCain Institute to moderate a discussion with some very distinguished panelists. I wanna first thank uh, Mrs. Cindy McCain uh, and the McCain Institute uh, for their thought leadership and for organizing today's discussion. Uh, I'd like to make some brief introductions and then we'll get right into the questions. We have uh, three guests who I think are known globally, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut he was uh, served in the House for three terms and served for eight years in the Connecticut General Assembly. We have Representative um, Michael McCall, Congressman from Texas, uh, with distinction as the Republican leader on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And we also have General Allen, who is the president of the Brookings Institute. He's a retired U.S. Marine Corps four-star general. Uh, former commander of the NATO uh, International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. So I want to begin by asking a uh, question to Senator Murphy. Uh, Senator, you've been uh, very supportive of President Biden's early steps uh, to reverse course on Iran after the last four years of the Trump administration. Uh, you supported lifting the travel restrictions on Iranian diplomats uh, in New York. Uh, you supported reversing the snapback of UN sanctions, um, and you also support quickly rejoining the Iran nuclear deal through direct diplomacy uh, with the Iranian regime, which is something which the last administration was unable to accomplish. What is your view on the terms of rejoining uh, the nuclear deal? Specifically, should the Biden administration rejoin the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action as it was, uh, when the Trump administration left it? Or should they insist on new language concerning intercontinental ballistic missiles, regional aggression, perhaps a, a stronger inspections regime? So we'd welcome your views on that, Senator. Well, uh, first, uh, let me thank the McCain Institute for uh, hosting uh, this virtual forum. Not as good as seeing everybody in person, but um, really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I know we have a short time, so uh, though it's a very big topic, I'll uh, keep my opening answer uh, brief. Uh, Brian, great to be with you and uh, General uh, Congressman. Uh, listen, no secret, I support rejoining uh, the JCPOA uh, on the prior terms. Uh, in fact, um, Senator Kane and I just sent uh, a letter yesterday to the administration signed by over half of the Democrats in the Senate uh, recommending the same. Uh, and. Um, well, I certainly uh, would love to be able to negotiate an agreement with Iran that includes concessions from them on all sorts of other malevolent behaviors, whether it be their ballistic missile program or their support for terrorist organizations in the region. Um, I, I, I watched the Trump uh, administration's approach over the course of four years in which they 
sought to apply crippling sanctions as, as a means to get the Iranians to the table on uh, what at the time was a set of 12 demands, including all of those behaviors. Um, and not only was that unsuccessful in even uh, beginning a negotiation on a broader, more comprehensive agreement. Uh, in fact, Iran restarted elements of its nuclear program that had been stopped under the JCPOA. They started actively shooting at U.S. forces in a way that was not happening during the majority of the Obama administration. And in some places like Yemen, they increased support for proxies. So uh, I just think the theory has been tested uh, and we would be better off to get back into the JCPOA and reunite the P5 plus one. Remember, that was a unique coalition, not just the U.S. and Europe, but China and Russia at the table with us. Um, if that group is reassembled, that allows us to have a unique unanimity of action um, and an ability to then approach those other uh, issues together. Um, it is also worth saying that if you want a broader agreement, you are going to have to do more than just release the sanctions. Um, I, I think Iran is likely willing to get into a regional security dialogue, but they will want that dialogue to include a reduction in uh, the kind of weapons that are pointed at them from places like Saudi Arabia and the Emiratis. Um, if their ballistic missile program is going to be put on the table, they would reasonably expect that the U.S. flow of weapons into uh, Gulf states would be on the table as well. Uh, and so I just think we have to be realistic about what that comprehensive negotiation will look like, be willing to enter it, but the world will just be safer uh, if Iran is a year away from breakouts to a nuclear weapon rather than three or four months from breakout. So yes, I think we should enter back into the agreement uh, on a compliance for compliance basis. I'm not afraid of taking the first step um, uh, and testing whether the Iranians are willing to reciprocate. Um, I think that puts us on a better playing field to litigate all sorts of other security issues that matter to us and our partners in the region. Senator, one follow-up question. <clears throat> if, if we are able to get into compliance for compliance and the United States re-enters the deal, uh, that would require them uh, lifting the oil and the financial sanctions. Will the administration have the leverage necessary for a follow-on deal if they lose the leverage on oil and banking sanctions? Well, I, I, I think we will, in part because um, th this, again, realigns the P5 plus one together. And um, I think that there is a legitimate question, uh, right, as to uh, which sanctions uh, are solely related to the nuclear program. Some of the sanctions over the last four years were applied for reasons um, other than the, um, than the withdrawal from the JCPOA. Uh, and so I, I think there's a legitimate question as to whether the United States has to release every existing sanction, every Trump era applied sanction. Uh, and then once again, I think that puts us in a position to uh, build a joint strategy with uh, our partners on these other programs. But yes, I will admit that we would have been much better off um, had we stayed in the JCPOA um, and been able then uh, to build a set of non-nuclear sanctions and non-nuclear policies starting in 2016, rather than having to begin that work now. Is it your sense that the administration will try to get back into the Iran nuclear deal. And then once, as Jake Sullivan says, they get the nuclear program back in the box, that that will then create the platform on which they do follow on deals. I think that was the original intent during the Obama administration. Uh, the JCPOA was supposed to be the beginning of, of subsequent deals. What's your sense of what happens after the, if, if they're able to successfully get all the parties back together? Well, I, um, I think that is, that is right. Um, but again, I think that those follow-on negotiations are likely ones that need to include regional partners. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you are talking about Iran's weapons program or you're talking about their support for uh, terrorist organizations in the region, um, those are negotiations you likely are going to have to have within a regional security architecture. Um, and uh, again, as I mentioned, they probably, um, it's probably not the same playbook that gets you 
um, a change in Iranian behavior when it comes to those other issues. It's probably not just the reimposition of multilateral sanctions and then a deal. Um, it probably involves um, a, a set of concessions from other regional partners um, on their military footprint in the region. Um, and to, to my mind, um, that's the right next step to take. Um, in, in fact, we should um, be in a place where the Iranians are not just talking to the United States and Europe, where the Iranians are talking to the Saudis and the Emiratis. Um, that is not going to happen until the JCPOA is back um, uh, in operation. And, and I have made the case, and I'll stop here, that, that Yemen is really the test case for whether there is an ability to have a regional conversation about security. The Saudis have put a good faith proposal on the table to wind down hostilities there. It can't bear fruit while we are still out of compliance with the JCPOA. But once we are back into the JCPOA, there's an opportunity for the Iranians and the Emiratis and the Saudis and of course the, the Yemeni government and the Houthis to sit down and try to bring that war to a close. In doing so, I think um, it may provide the grassroots for other important discussions in the region. So there, there is, I think, opportunities for that dialogue um, involving regional players to happen. It can't happen though until we settle this question of whether we are inside or outside the nuclear agreement. Before I ask Congressman McCall the next question, uh, let me ask General Allen and, and, uh, and, and invite him uh, to respond to Senator Murphy. S specifically, uh, it seems like Senator Murphy is linking resolving some other regional issues to first getting into the Iran nuclear deal. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that and also uh, General, uh, I, I thought Senator Murphy was was smart to bring up Yemen. Would welcome your thoughts on that, both on the humanitarian side um, and on the sort of the broader regional problem that it presents of the Iranians using the Houthis to essentially Lebanize uh, the Gulf and to create a kind of Hezbollah on Saudi southern border. Well, it, it would be no secret that I uh, very broadly agree with uh, the senator on. Uh, his, his appraisal for where this should go. I don't know whether the outcome of a JCPOA uh, negotiation <clears throat> will look the same uh, as it did uh, as it was negotiated several years ago, but the administration is absolutely right to try it again. Uh, it's absolutely right <clears throat> in compliance with its own stated uh, objectives of multilateralizing, once again, uh, the American approach to our diplomacy by bringing the P5 plus one in. Uh, I also believed at some point, uh, although I'm not quite so optimistic now, that this would also be an opportunity for us to work with the Russians and the Chinese on an area where we could probably find some common interests. Uh, that seems to be increasingly difficult now. The Chinese have got a separate deal with the Iranians. Uh, they're getting uh, oil from the Iranians now. <clears throat> we're, we're sanctioning the Russians today. Uh, the efforts with the Chinese in Alaska did not go well. The relationship seems to be fraught at the moment. So I had hoped <clears throat> that the platform of uh, a reopening of the conversation about the JCPOA uh, would in fact uh, be an opportunity, not just to multilateralize uh, our re-entry into the process, but to find a way forward with the Russians and the Chinese for this administration. I think that's going to be difficult and we'll see it playing out uh, as difficulty for this conversation. Uh, Yemen is a catastrophe in, in so many ways. And I've had, uh, publicly had some very strong words uh, with respect to the, the uh, Saudi-led coalition uh, and what it has done uh, in Yemen in, in reaction to fighting the Houthis who have been in fact supported by the Iranians. Um, so I, I welcome uh, an effort by the Saudis uh, to try to find a way to end this conflict, to end the humanitarian crisis. Uh, but we also have now a, a relationship with the Saudis, which I think is quite fraught. Uh, and, and so there, the, the multiple different levels and different relationships that we're going to have to work on simultaneously as we seek to re-enter the JCPOA, as we seek to have a dialogue with the Iranians on um, their regional behaviors, as we seek to try to bring our allies and partners into the region, uh, into the conversation, uh, is going to be a, a multi-level, very nuanced conversation. But we, we need to address it uh, as a holistic strategic approach, because all of these pieces play to the center. And the Iranians with very sophisticated uh, centrifuges now, <laughs> relatively speaking, uh, except after the uh, uh, power outage last week, um, are enriching to a point where it should be quite worrisome to us. And they may in fact be also uh, unleashing capabilities for the 
the milling of enriched materials for uh, a weaponization effort. So it's not just enrichment that we should be watching for. In fact, the nuclear program has always been three real components. One is the delivery system, whatever it might be. The second is the weapon system itself and how it is uh, developed. And the third is the enrichment. Uh, and any comprehensive program that we want have got to deal with all of those capabilities. So as we go forward, I absolutely agree with the Senator. It was right to go back in. Whether the JCP, JCPOA that comes out on the other end looks like the one that we go in, go back into remains to be determined. But it has to be, uh, the outcome has to be a regional conversation. Uh, and part of this has got to be a U.S. reappraisal, reassessment of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, especially as it relates to Saudi Arabia's actions in Yemen. General, uh, let me ask one follow-up question on something you said. Um, Iran's ability to move so quickly to get up to 20%, does that argue for stronger terms on the nuclear side? Well, I think it does. I mean, it, there has to be, uh, I was uh, uh, a few years ago involved in the six party talks. So I'm used to talk words for word, actions for actions and, and taking the kinds of steps that will be necessary to push down uh, a nuclear program. And so there will have to be demonstrable efforts uh, by the Iranians in the aftermath of the agreement uh, to dispose of that highly enriched uranium or rapidly highly enriched uranium to the back down to the level that we should expect, which is somewhere around 3.75% uh, enrichment. They're up to 20. The, what's, what needs to be understood is the amount of effort to get from 3.75 to 20 is a lot. The effort to get from 20 to fissile levels is not nearly as much. So they have taken a big step and we need to have the outcome of whatever the final JCPOA looks like has got to get that, that material has got to be disposed of in a proper way. It's got to be part of the outcome. We cannot leave them with that kind of uh, stockpile of, of fissile material or, or nearly fissile material. So that's got to be part of the conversation. Let me turn to Congressman McCall. Um, Sir, you were a strong supporter of the maximum pressure campaign and the approach to diplomatically isolating Iran. I think you were a supporter of um, Secretary Pompeo's list of 12 demands, uh, which were an outline of the things that uh, he thought were necessary to get a deal worthy of its name. Um, why do you think that was the right approach? And also, how would you appraise the early steps of the Biden administration and their policy toward Iran? Well, first, Brian, let me uh, thank you for your service uh, to the nation, uh, particularly on this uh, issue. Um, I did support the maximum pressure campaign. I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, Secretary Pompeo <clears throat> and I agreed that the JCPOA, as negotiated, uh, was not working. Um, and uh, as I've talked to the new Secretary of State, Blinken, he talks about a longer, stronger agreement in his words. And I hope um, he's uh, correct on this. Um, I think it was deficient in many ways. Uh, uh, first of all, the ballistic missile uh, ICBM capability was not on the table. There were no, um, the sunset provision guaranteed a nuclear Iran. Uh, the malign influence of Iran in the region um, as well. And, and inspections were not uh, adequate in my view. Uh, so, you know, you never fear, um, to negotiate, but you don't negotiate out of fear as they talk about it. I think the diplomats, when the diplomats fail, we go to war. And I think nobody wants that. There's bipartisan support for a non-nuclear Iran. But I do think you have to negotiate at a position of strength and not weakness as history has taught us. Um, I am a firm believer that the sanctions should not be uh, stripped or conceded until Iran makes uh, very strong concessions with respect to their nuclear capability. I think General Allen is correct when it, his analysis of the urgency of this, because, you know, the Ayatollah said he's at 60% enrichment. If that's true, um, they're probably months away from 90%, which would be, uh, would give them nuclear capability. And then the idea of a nuclear warhead attached to a short range missile, uh, then you're talking about the period of possibly a year that puts, um, the, the Arabian Peninsula and Israel at great risk uh, from Iran. Um, so when I talk to the secretary, again, I, I think the longer, stronger is correct. I just hope that that's played out. I don't know if this, it will be called the JCPOA or 
something else. But I, again, I think the previous administration under your leadership made great progress in crippling Iran's um, uh, economy. Uh, 70 billion, um, it cost them 70 billion in just oil revenues alone, not to mention the sanctions on the banks, the IRGC, uh, and their mining uh, capabilities. So um, uh, I think we've handed, and, and Brian, you've handed to this administration a gift to negotiate out of strength with respect to the crippling sanctions. And, and I would argue not to uh, weaken that position by stripping sanctions before Iran's made any concessions at all. Um, and I, I don't, I think we have to ask the obvious question here also, is how uh, in good faith is the Ayatollah really negotiating here? And can we trust him? Um, I think there's bipartisan support for um, a, a more comprehensive JCPOA that would include the ICBM capability, a better inspection capability, um, and their malign influence, you know, going from Iraq to uh, Syria, Lebanon, um, uh, to, the, the, to Yemen. All the proxies of Iran have, have, um, are really threatening the region. Um, and um, again, Brian, I think uh, you've handed to them a gift to negotiate a better deal. And I, I, I'm in, in very good contact with the secretary currently. Um, I just don't want us to give away the store before uh, we get to a deal. And that's my biggest concern uh, with the readiness to, to um, so quickly move into this negotiation. Um, I, again, I think Pompeo did a great job crippling the Iran economy, and that should lead to a better negotiation. Senator Murphy uh, would welcome uh, your reaction to that. Um, and, and specifically, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, being open to the possibility of a longer and stronger Iran nuclear deal. Um, would, would that be something that you would support uh, from your position in the Senate? Or would you like to see, or, or it could be easier um, in terms of negotiations and diplomacy to just re-enter compliance for compliance and then table those other issues uh, for down the road. What are your thoughts on longer and stronger deal? Well, obviously I would welcome a longer and stronger deal. Uh, if it was up to me, um, we would enter into, into a uh, agreement with Iran uh, that would cover all of their detrimental behaviors in the region would require very few, if any, painful concessions from the United States and our allies would allow us to continue to sell weapons to our friends. I, I just think that there is, in this case, a difference between what we want and what is possible. And my belief is that what is most important, especially as we've discussed uh, in the midst of um, a very quick enrichment timetable being displayed to the world by the Iranians, um, that we take their um, uh, nuclear weapons pathway off the table as quickly uh, as possible. And again, get back into an alliance with our partners, an unlikely group of partners um, now, because presently um, we would be negotiating that deal with the Iranians by ourselves, And I ultimately don't think that we can get there um, without the P5 plus one, who frankly are going to ask us to first get back into the JCPOA before moving to all of these uh, other issues. So um, I, um, I would welcome a longer, stronger deal. I think the pathway to get there um, is through a compliance for a compliance arrangement on the JCPOA. Senator, let me ask one follow-up question about um, <clears throat> peaceful nuclear power. So in, in the Gulf, we have uh, the United Arab Emirates, which I think this is its 11th year. Uh, it has a nuclear program uh, but they don't enrich uh, any, any nuclear material. Um, if you look around the world at all of the countries that have peaceful nuclear power, more than half of them don't enrich. Do you think that for the stability of the Gulf, uh, a, a country like Iran ought to follow the example of UAE and, and, and declare that they will have a peaceful nuclear program, but they will not enrich? Because if you do that, you then automatically moot the question of how, uh, of, of how close they are to nuclear breakup. Yes. Uh, I mean, again, you know, we're, we're talking about, if we're talking about preferences, 
then of course my preference would be that you create a standard in the region where there is no local enrichment. Um, and, uh, but my worry is that um, often our policy in the Middle East is driven by what we hope to happen, driven by plans that we write on a piece of paper rather than by realities on the ground. And, and I could give you a broader critique of many of our missteps in the region that I think are driven by um, wants rather than possibility. Uh, and so the reason that we ended up with an agreement in Iran that included a limited means of enrichment was simply because um, the alternative was not available. And I understand it is always very easy for folks to say, well, you could have gotten them to commit to no enrichment. You could have gotten them to commit uh, to give up their ballistic missile program. And, and that is a very easy critique to make. Um, if you aren't in that room. Um, I, I tend to believe that we had our best negotiators uh, that were at that table who had um, the interests of the United States and the world uh, at heart. I believe they got the best deal possible. And though I wish we could get further commitments on enrichment, uh, I think getting Iran a year from breakout um, is, um, is a good deal um, and, and the best deal available to us. Great, General Allen. Go ahead, please. Sorry, jump in. A couple of things. One of the things I, I wanted to come in on uh, with the congressman's comments, uh, and it triggered a comment not uh, in dispute with, is that the clock is running here. We've got an election coming up in Iran. Uh, and we have been able to deal with Rouhani and uh, Zarif. Um, now, Bob Gates has always said, I've been in my lifetime uh, search for a moderate Iranian. I've never found one. And so the probability is that uh, maybe there's distinctions without a difference between uh, that, that team, that leadership team, and hardliners. But the outcome of the last administration, the killing of Soleimani, which I think you may ask me about here in a moment, yeah. and some other uh, activities in the region, it, it is not a foregone conclusion that we're going to see Rouhani be reelected. And if real hardliners come in, uh, we may find both a difference in the regional behavior, but also Iran's uh, view on its enrichment and how it has to defend itself and ultimately its uh, willingness to, uh, to deal on the issue of the JCPOA. So that's the first thing. And the, the other thing I would say is that the, uh, the actions that we take to your question, uh, Brian, about the UAE, we should always try to have as one of the outcomes of all of these conversations we have on nuclear capabilities and civil nuclear programs, has all of our actions have got to, in the end, reinforce our commitment and the global commitment to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And, and every occasion where we are in these conversations where the outcome could, in fact, lessen the strength of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, then I think we create a greater uh, danger for us going down the road. And so when you hear the Emiratis or others who have civil nuclear programs uh, commit themselves to low enrichment for the purposes of simply fueling whatever their nuclear civil nuclear program is, that reinforces the integrity of the no Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. When we, uh, when we see people backing away from that, we all as a community of nations uh, have to work together to strengthen the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Otherwise, uh, I think the outcome is uh, pretty imaginable. General, would you like to see the Biden administration re-enter the Iran nuclear deal on the, on, on the same terms as they were negotiated? Or would you like to see um, some discussion uh, around the sunset clauses, the absence of ICBMs, the inspections regime, the arms embargo, UN arms embargo expired uh, under the Iran deal. Where do you come down on that question of sort of re-entering under the status quo ante or trying to uh, negotiate better terms? Well, I think the first thing, I, I, it's a hard question to answer. And I, I, I cleave more clearly, I think, with the Senator on this matter than probably anyone else. Um, I don't know that uh, other than to commit to re-enter the conversation about the JCPOA, we're going to see an outcome there look like it was in 2015 when it was ultimately uh, successfully negotiated. But we do have to have uh, some ultimate conversation about ballistic missiles. Uh, we do have to have a conversation about sunset clauses. Uh, we do have to have a conversation uh, about uh, a, a regional approach ultimately to uh, supporting the outcome. This is probably why Secretary Austin's in Israel right now, is to have this conversation with our Israeli friends and counterparts there. Um, 
So I think it's a good place to start. I don't have any expectation that the outcome of our conversation with the uh, Iranians and the P5 plus one uh, will, will look like at the end what it looked like as we started. We just have to expect that. Lots of water has passed under the bridge in the meantime, uh, many changes in the region, uh, the relationship uh, with the Chinese and the Russians, which, which uh, originally in 2015 uh, resulted in their signatures right next to ours on this agreement, uh, that re those relationships are now fraught. And so I, I think it's not possible for us to expect that the outcome of our re-entry is going to look like, uh, in the end, how, we, how it looked when it was uh, ultimately agreed to in 2015. But we have to, first we have to start the process and we've started the process mm -hmm. and good for us for doing it. Uh, and now we need to be patient. Are you surprised the Iranians have rejected the uh, offer of direct diplomacy? No, I'm not surprised, okay. uh, not surprised at all. Um, but I don't think they'll stay there. Uh, and for now, that's, that's a good enough start. Let's get started. Let's start to have the conversation. Let's build uh, the habitual conversations. And you know, one of the things we can do is easily walk away if we have to. We just did. And if this is just talking for talking purposes and we, our intelligence capabilities continue to detect clear movement towards increased enrichment, uh, building more cascades and, and locating them in a place that might be difficult for us to get at, uh, and, and ultimately uh, uh, continued work potentially on the actual weaponization itself, as opposed to simply enrichment, then we can take the steps that are necessary to defend ourselves. And I will simply add that uh, one of my principal duties when I was a deputy commander of CENTCOM for three years was to pay very close attention to the Iranian nuclear program and the military activities that would be necessary mm -hmm. to deal with it. So we have the capability, uh, and I think that uh, we'll just have to watch this very closely. So, um, General, let me turn the subject to uh, Qasem Soleimani, and uh, I'd like to ask you a question and then, then invite Congressman McCall uh, to give his reactions as well. It has been about a year and a couple of months uh, since the killing of Qasem Soleimani. General, as you know, he was the key part of Iran's power projection uh, uh, and it's, it's expanding its sphere of influence. What, what have you seen change in the region for, for good and bad uh, over the last year in Iran's theaters of influence uh, with General Soleimani off the battlefield? It's a great question, Brian. And let me, let me say I'm, I'm late to offering my very sincere thanks to you for your service. Uh, uh, I know that was a very tough time uh, for you and, uh, and I, I wanna thank you for that. Uh, I also want to thank the Sedona Forum and the McCain Institute, and in particular, express my great uh, respects for Cindy McCain. Um, so I was a commander on the ground in Iraq. I commanded the war in Afghanistan. I was deputy commander at CENTCOM. And during all three of those experiences, the principal influence in the entire region, uh, action influence in the entire region was Qasem Soleimani. Um, and I, as I would explain, people would say, well, who is this guy? My explanation was from roughly the Western one third of Afghanistan to the Southern border of Lebanon, right up on the Israeli border and into the various Hamas positions in uh, Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, he had virtually unilateral sway on defense, security, terrorism policy and foreign policy. There was no other individual in the entire Iranian government with that much power short of the Supreme Leader. And um, I think at any given moment, the Supreme Leader would have been very concerned about uh, Soleimani if he'd ever had political aspirations. Um, we actually had him in the gun sites on many occasions. I, I remember very well when under Lloyd Austin's leadership, the American assisted counterattack by the Iraqis into Tikrit in, uh, against the Islamic State Soleimani was all over the battlefield, uh, providing Iranian support to other Iraqi elements in the attack as well. They didn't do very well, frankly, as compared to what we helped the Iraqis do themselves. Mm -hmm. But one day an American bomb landed pretty close to Qasem Soleimani. And uh, he complained that we were trying to get him. And I don't remember whether it was General Austin or some other uh, American general who explained that, pal, we could have got you anytime. So it's not just, it's not, wasn't by accident that uh, it was clearly a coincidence. Um, you asked an important question. Uh, he, uh, my guess is, or not my guess, but my sense is that while much of the Iranian behavior appears to look the same in the region, 
for example, Iranian on, Iranian behavior on the ground in uh, Syria, the IRGC advisors to Hezbollah, uh, which Soleimani arranged for Hezbollah to fight his infantry on the ground in Syria, uh, Iranian behavior in support of the Houthis, Iranian uh, terrorist support throughout the region, Iranian support to Iraq. Um, all, almost all of this uh, is a direct result of Soleimani's personal relationships and personal networks. And in a region where individual prestige and individual leadership, as opposed to institutional capabilities, really is at the center of uh, many of these countries' capabilities. When Qasem Soleimani was killed by that uh, missile strike, we took out the single most important actor in the region. Um, now, uh, Ismail Khani, who is his successor, uh, would, would occupy the seat, but he is far less uh, a figure of influence in that region than Qasem, Soleim Qasem Soleimani was. And so while it may appear <clears throat> that in many respects, Iranian disruptive terrorist behavior remains in essence at the status quo, I, my sense is if we pushed on any one of these, uh, we would find much less capacity, much less decisiveness by the Iranians than if Qasem Soleimani was still alive. Now, to the, this administration's uh, benefit, a couple of the uh, Iranian-supported Shia Iraqi militia elements uh, took a shot at some of our troops uh, not too long ago, and we hammered them pretty hard. And that message was very important that if, you're in a, if you are supporting Iran, if you are supporting Iraqi militia groups and you attack the Americans or you attack American allies, you're gonna pay a price for it. And it's a message, not just for the group itself, it's a very clear message back to Iran. So Qasem Soleimani is gone. He's responsible for the deaths of thousands of people in the region to include hundreds of American troops, our precious American troops. He's gone and that's a good thing. But I think Iranian behavior by and large still looks in many respects, the way it did before, but I don't think it could, it has the resilience. I don't think it has the foundational depth that it had when Qasem Soleimani was exerting his influence from Afghanistan all the way to the northern border of Israel. Very thoughtful uh, reflections, General, thank you. Congressman McCall, what are, what, what are your thoughts on uh, the region one year after uh, the death of Soleimani? Well, I agree with uh, General Allen's uh, comments, and um, he was a mastermind of terror for two decades in the region. Not General and, Allen, by the way. What's that? No, I'm just kidding. No, and and um, uh, I think it was a significant setback uh, for Iran, but I do believe their behavior has not changed. Uh, they are getting more provocative. Um, and I think uh, the president... Uh, Trump made the right decision to take him out. We had some debate on the House floor about his authority to do so. Uh, Jay Johnson, good friend of mine, called him a lawful military objective. Uh, he was designated as a, a, a terrorist under the Obama administration. I think the president had every right under Article II self-defense to take him out um, and under the 2002 AU, AUMF. Um, you know, Soleimani was meeting with his partners in Lebanon, Damascus, and in Iraq. Um, they had hit our embassy. We think that he was going back to report to the Ayatollah to, uh, to then um, launch a major offensive uh, strike. And um, we stopped that uh, from happening. Um, so I think it, um, from a military uh, standpoint, I think General is correct. It's a big setback for them, but their bad behavior uh, is still uh, continuing. They're, they've gotten very provocative recently with this, the strike in the green zone and in Erbil. Uh, I think President Biden was absolutely correct in a proportionate response uh, in Syria uh, to take out the, the proxies of Iran. Um, and these proxies are, are really strengthening. I mean, since the 2002 AUMF, uh, and by the way, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee um, it'll be on the floor is, is uh, going to repeal the 2002 AUMF. I believe that we need to update the, the AUMF to consider the, the threats of today very different from 2002, as General knows, uh, on the ground in Iraq to, to reflect the threats coming from Iran and its proxies in the region. Um, so we're gonna have, a, I think, a very um, interesting 
a debate in the House on that. I think it is time to update the AUMF to reflect the current threats coming, you know, from Iran. Um, and I, um, I do believe Soleimani, we're, we're, uh, the world is a safer place with him gone uh, and not uh, continuing to, uh, you know, he, he killed uh, 600 of our troops, you know, with his, uh, his mines uh, in, in Iraq. And so, um, um, again, I think the president had every right to do so. I think he did show a lot of restraint when it came to uh, Iran when they took down our drone, but we had to respond. When they attack our embassy, we have to respond uh, in kind to them because that's what they understand most is strength and that we are going to hit them back to stop this bad behavior in, in the region. Um, so anyway, I, I look forward to um, uh, moving forward on the committee. We're, we're going to hear from you know, our, um, uh, from the DOD and State Department about what we need to do to update and authorize use of military force to reflect that current threat. And I think it's gonna be a very uh, healthy discussion. Senator Murphy, uh, <clears throat> your thoughts and feel free to include uh, your thoughts on AUMF. Well, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with um, uh, Congressman McCall. Uh, I, I hope that we enter into a bipartisan conversation about repealing um, AUMFs that remain on the books uh, that don't connect to current threats uh, and reorient um, our current AUMF so that it accurately describes those that um, are um, are present. Um, I, I think my worry in entering into that conversation is that we create um, sort of so much wiggle room for an administration that uh, they never have to come to Congress um, with respect to any set of new hostilities against another nation state. Um, my worry about the legality of the um, Soleimani strike uh, is frankly due to the fact that uh, whether we like it or not, Iran is a sovereign nation. And well, in this case, it did not uh, turn out that the uh, strike on Soleimani turned into a conventional conflict between the United States and Iran. Um, it's important to remember how close we came. Remember, Iran fired on a base housing hundreds of U.S. troops. They um, just missed. Uh, it is entirely possible that there could have been 100 U.S. casualties in the strike that happened several days later. And ask yourself, what would have occurred in the aftermath of 100 U.S. troops being killed in uh, Iraq several days after that strike? Would we be in a conventional conflict today with Iran? Um, uh, after an episode uh, of that scale. So I think it is worth remembering how close we came to something you know, much more serious. Um, and I also think it, it bears thinking about the culture of martyrdom in the Islamic world. And um, while I think it's true that we did degrade uh, the IRGC's capabilities and the Cut Force capabilities by taking out uh, Qasem Soleimani, um, I also generally agree with General Allen that the pace of activities has not materially changed. You could frankly make an argument that th their coordination with the Houthis in Yemen has increased, that the pace of attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq has increased, um, and that their determination to continue to strike against the United States and our allies um, uh, increased uh, after we elevated Qasem Soleimani from you know, very accurately described as the most powerful individual in the Middle East for all intents and purposes to a martyr uh, whose memory never ever vanishes. Um, so I have questions about the legality of it. Um, I also have questions about the effectiveness uh, of the strike, but to Congressman McCall's perspective, I think it's more reason why we should be um, uh, more involved as a Congress in authorizing military uh, activity, not uh, less involved, because there are probably instances in which um, some of these surgical strikes are warranted. Um, it just is not the case that you can't do that um, if you consult with Congress uh, first. For a final question, <clears throat> which I'll put to everybody, it, it, it's really a, a timing question. When President Trump left the Iran deal, it had very big consequences. And if President Biden were to re-enter the deal, it would also be a significant um, uh, decision. The Iranian regime 
uh, accounts for about 3% of the world's oil supply. And when the United States was in the Iran nuclear deal, there was uh, enormous foreign direct investment in Iran. Uh, when the Trump administration left the deal, uh, most of Iran's banks were put on the blacklist. They were disconnected um, from the uh, global financial system. Um, so if the Biden administration does re-enter, uh, it would have consequences for, I think, economies in Europe and in the Middle East, but it would also have consequences on uh, global oil supply and, and the price of oil. Senator Murphy, I'll start with you. Do you think that the Biden administration will be able to re-enter the deal um, uh, this calendar year and lift the oil and banking sanctions and then Iran comes back into compliance on all of its on all of its nuclear obligations. Do you think it will happen this year? Or do you think we're looking in the next year? Uh, to General Allen's point, it is probably true that the clock is ticking and every day that we get closer to uh, the Iranian elections, it is probably less likely uh, that we are able to enter into an agreement that looks like the JCPOA. It may be that there are um, sort of more incremental steps or confidence building measures that are enacted, but that you know, by the middle or, or, or later parts of the year, we are not back into full compliance on both sides. Um, I will say that it's always been, I think, this outstanding question, hotly debated uh, amongst uh, uh, both academic and expert circles as to um, how much it matters uh, who is sitting in the prime minister or foreign minister's office uh, and um, whether really all that matters is if the Supreme Leader wants a deal and wants the sanctions gone, um, he can probably make that happen regardless of whether there is a so-called hardliner or a so-called moderate uh, on the backside of these elections. And lastly, you know, let's remember that you know, even when the sanctions were released, um, uh, there was a lot of consternation in Iran because they didn't actually get the economic benefit that they had hoped and planned from the official release of U.S. sanctions because there were all sorts of informal holds that still existed uh, on uh, private sector con uh, conduct in the Iranian economy. And so um, even if we were to sort of fully re-enter the deal, it's important to remember that the United States and Europe still hold a lot of cards um, with respect to how much benefit the Iranian economy gets. Um, and so I think that's an important caveat, even though I would probably guess that by the end of the year, we may be on our way back into compliance, though not all the way there. Congressman McCall, what's, what's your prediction on timing? Well, I think there are outside uh, certain factors, I think, that are uh, putting it on a timeline. Um, and that would be the elections, as has been pointed out, and I think also the timeline, the how soon they could get to uh, full enrichment and uh, capability to deliver a nuclear warhead with a short-range missile. Um, but I hate to put it on a timeline. My view is, I think the Obama administration, and I remember Secretary Kerry was just so eager to get a deal, but not necessarily a good deal. Um, and, and so I would, however long it takes to get a good deal is what I think should be the outcome here, not just simply getting a deal for deal's sake and then saying we had this great achievement when you in fact have a very weak agreement. So, um, um, but I do think the fact that they are getting closer to a nuclear bomb is a driver uh, for the talks. Um, I do think we have a duty to negotiate. Um, but again, I would go back to my in initial premise that uh, the previous administration really empowered this administration with the tools it needs to negotiate a better deal. And that is the crippling sanctions, uh, 70 billion in oil revenues, and not to mention the sanctions that you put on the, the banks and the IRGC, the sanctions on the IRGC, which were important. Um, all that gives, I think, uh, this administration a lot of tools in the toolbox to negotiate a better deal, uh, regardless of how long that takes. But um, um, I think General Allen's correct on the elections. We don't know um, how long um, the current, uh, um, you know, the current uh, positions of power will, will remain there. Um, so I, I, I think it's, um, you know, I support the longer, stronger deal. I, I just hope the secretary lives up to that. Uh, bargain that he has made with the Congress. And again, this is a very bipartisan position. Uh, we 
We want to see a better deal in Congress. And I think everyone agrees that a nuclear run is not going to be acceptable. God forbid we get to that point where we have some ser very serious decisions to have to make uh, from a military standpoint as well. Uh, so we always want the diplomats to succeed. Otherwise, we're looking at, at war and nobody wants that outcome. General Allen, your thoughts? Sure. I know this is the last question, so let me just say again how great it was to be with Senator Murphy and Congressman McCall. Um, uh, and I'll also say that I absolutely agree with both of them on uh, the need to uh, have a good, hard relook at the AUMF. It is absolutely time for that. Uh, my own view is that uh, we will not see a dramatic uh, change by the end of this calendar year, and I don't think a timeline, as, as Congressman McCall implied, uh, he doesn't like it either, that we, we should put a timeline on this. Uh, first thing is get, get the conversation going, establish objectives, mm -hmm. probably incrementalize the outcome, try to have an early success that's agreeable to the P5 plus one, the Iranians and our friends and partners, and then see where it goes from there. Um, but we also have to be, and I have not heard President Biden say this, but I heard President Obama say this frequently, that the United States will never permit the Iranians to have a nuclear weapon. Um, we need to say that. Uh, and so that needs to be out there as we pursue, as the Congressman properly said, a, a diplomatic approach. We need to give diplomacy a chance, but the Iranians need to know. They wanna try a breakout. Even if they locate that program on the backside of the moon, we're gonna get at, get at it. And so they just need to understand that. So it's in their interests economically, for their society, for the region, for them to sit down because they've got the chance now to have this conversation to try to improve the conditions for them. But if they choose to go after a nuclear weapon, uh, it will not go well for them. And uh, we have the capability of dealing with that. Yeah. Terrific. Um, I had the pleasure um, when I was in the State Department of working with all three of you and um, uh, appreciate all your service to the nation. Um, we are grateful to the McCain Institute for providing this platform to have a discussion on really one of the most important national security issues uh, facing the United States. It's kind of been that way for 41 years, um, but it, it always needs updating and to have the analysis that we've heard today over the last hour or so has been uh, a real benefit and a very thoughtful. It kind of shows that you can have a thoughtful bipartisan discussion on controversial issues. And so, May that theme continue. I want to again thank uh, Mrs. Cindy McCain, the McCain Institute, and um, all three of uh, the guests on today's uh, panel. And um, again, thank you.